All right. Ready for the word? All right. It looks like summer. Yeah, it's all right. It's all right. But God's going to touch you today. It's going to be beautiful. So uh, the last couple of weeks, I, uh, I was talking about what knowing God's heart, right? Can, and then also a little bit about, I called it the secret of seeking, basically seeking God's presence, seeking God's face. And, and I want to continue a little bit with kind of the same idea, and this is called the increase of presence. I want to talk about the presence of God. And having an increase of his presence with us, in us, in our lives, right? It's highly desirable. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, and the, one of the first questions that uh, would come up, and I've been asked this question even recently, somebody said, well, isn't, isn't God omnipresent? I mean, that's a fancy word that means he's everywhere at once. And the answer is yes. God is present everywhere at once. He is. The Bible says that the, in him we live and move and have our being, right? He created everything. He's present. Yes, he's present. But when we talk about presence... We're talking about manifested presence. That means his presence suddenly becomes real in a way that you feel it, in a way that you experience it, right? And yes, God is making himself real to you, tangible to you in some way. And that's a powerful thing, manifested presence. And I know it's not often talked about, but I value that highly and I want to talk about it, right? And... So that, that uh, started with Moses, actually. We, we read that verse at, at communion, but I want, to, uh, I want to read more of the passage, Exodus thirty three twelve to 18. Uh, so Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Basically, Moses is asking, you called me to lead these people into the promised land, right? And I'm one guy, and there's a lot of them. Is anybody going with me? Are you with me? Is anybody helping me? Am I on my own on this one? That's kind of what he's saying, part two, right? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> now, therefore, I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way, that I may know you. There's this prayer. I want to know you, God, huh? I'm hungry for you. I want to know you. And then I may find grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people. And God said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Ooh, that's powerful. Basically, he started off saying, is anybody going to go with me on this? Are you sending anybody with me on this, right? God said, I'm going to go with you. My presence, my presence. And he means, of course, my manifested presence. And when God led, you know, led them, Israel, out of uh, on the way towards the promised land, he actually manifested himself as a pillar of cloud by day and pillar of fire by night, right? And there was, there was, ooh, there was presence, right? There was presence there, uh, and visible and tangible. Uh, generally, when we talk about presence, though, still, we're talking about manifested presence in a way that we feel, we suddenly feel God. And a lot of times, most commonly, that happens during worship, right? When we're, right, we're worshiping and suddenly you start to feel presence, presence. And I'll talk more about what that, you know, different people experience that different ways. But anointed, I'm sorry, uh, manifested presence. God said, I'm going to go with you. I'm going to give you rest also, which is another topic, but it's, it's cool. In God's presence, our heart finds its home. It's a beautiful thing. And then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. Yeah, I don't even want to go if, if you're not with me on this one, right? Yeah. For how, will, how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us? So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. This is really cool, too, because Moses is, is saying uh, your presence is going to be the only thing that really sets us, sets us apart. Right? Your presence. Because otherwise, we just have a religion. Everybody has a religion. Right? Right? And so God says, or Moses said, no, your manifested presence with us, right? Leading us, guiding us, that we experience and that is known to be among us. That's the only thing that sets us apart from anybody else. What does that have to do with us today? In the new covenant, same thing. In, yeah, the presence of God in us, upon us, with us is what sets us apart from the world, isn't it? It really is. And so it's not just, you know, so it doesn't just look like we have a religion and nothing else, right? It's the presence of God, that relationship, that, that sense of his closeness, his nearness, right? And, and that, that felt presence and how he manifests himself through us in beautiful ways. That's what sets us apart to the world and shows the world that God, God is with us. And they should believe in Jesus, right? Also, go ahead. 
So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. And then Moses said, please show me your glory. I love that, because God, Almighty God, just said, I'm going to be with you. My presence will go with you, right? It'll be visible, tangible, right? And then Moses said, yeah, as long as we got this far, how about more? Right. I love that. I love that. that was, I, that's a rocking moment for Moses in my mind. More. Can we have more? Can you show me your glory? Right? And that's like the, the word glory, uh, it had a secular meaning, but it also had a meaning with God. The secular meaning was like a, if a king had glory, that meant he was very rich and he had a big throne and he had gold castle or whatever he had, right? And there's his glory or his power or his armies, whatever. But in the, in the, uh, the sense of God, when, you, when he says, show me your glory, God's glory really does mean his manifested presence, his felt presence, his visible presence, or whatever, right? In the, even when, uh, in the Old Testament, when King Solomon built a temple for God's presence, right? And then dedicated that temple, and it says the presence of God came into that temple like a cloud, visibly like a cloud, right? And the, and the priests were falling down on their, on their back, on their face, they, not, not just because they were being humbled, it was because they couldn't literally stand up. They were just <laughs> falling down under the glory of God, under the presence of God. The presence, right? That's the glory. It's the glory is that manifested presence. Ooh, we want that, don't we? Right? Some, yeah, we absolutely want that. I, I'm hungry for that all the time. I always want more. My walk with God started off with presence, and, I, and to this day, I just want, I always want his presence, and I want more presence. I just do, right? And, uh, oh, and, and, I, and I want that for all of us. I want that for all of us. Um, show me your glory. It's kind of the difference here between, uh, I guess, would you rather have a pen pal or would you rather have a friend who's face to face with you sitting by you? Which is better? Or in our culture today, would you rather have a, uh, an online friend somewhere or would you rather have a physical friend face to face with you next to you? What's, what's better? Yeah, you want a real, a pre somebody present with you, right? And that's kind of the difference in, in knowing the presence of God, that manifested presence of God when you feel him with you. Right? And maybe not every moment, but there's, there's those moments when you feel God with you. It's like, ah, oh, it's so beautiful, right? And there's those moments when he speaks, communicates to you. Those moments, right? The real relationship, the real presence. Not everybody, even lots of people that believe in Jesus don't have that. Sometimes because they don't know it's available, right? Sometimes, I, I don't know. Well, but I do know, I, I talked about it, what was it, a couple weeks ago, the secret of seeking, or that was last week, wasn't it? Uh, anyway, the idea was that when you purposely get alone, right, with God, and you do what's called seeking, right? You say, God, I want to know you. I want to know you. Please reveal yourself to me more. Please draw closer to me. I want your presence with me more, right? I want to, I want to show me your glory, right? I want to know you, God. I want to know your heart. I want to be closer. When you, when you say those things alone with God, nobody else hearing you, right? There's something that starts, Right? There's a real relationship that begins to manifest more, and it's a powerful, powerful thing. It doesn't always just, you know, like instantly hit you on the head, right? Sometimes you press in, right? The Bible says that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's Hebrews 11.6, if you're interested. God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, which diligently means even if you don't have like a rocking experience the first time you say that, you continue, right? You press in and you seek God. You say, God, I want to know you. And you come back and you say, God, I want to know you. And you get on your face and you say, God, I want to know you, right? And something begins to happen. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And the reward is you get to know him, right? Like he, he does come. He does, right, reveal himself to you more. He reveals himself more as you value that. And, and it is a humbling thing to do, isn't it? It is a humbling thing to do. But... That's the, those are the people God says, when you humble yourself, I will lift you up. I will exalt you, right? It's a beautiful thing. Uh, let's go on to uh, Genesis 8, 6 to 12. So uh, this passage talks about Noah and what happens after the flood. And the reason I'm going to read it is because there's a prophetic symbolic revelation here of the two covenants, two major covenants of the Bible, the old covenant under Moses, the laws of Moses, and then the new covenant uh, in Christ. And the, 
the Bible kind of contrasts these two covenants over and over and over and over and over. It's just a thing that happens a lot. If you're aware of it, you'll, you'll see it. But, but it comes out a lot in symbolic form. Because the, the, the two covenants really were the two major ways that you could approach God or interact with God, right? Try to interact with God. Old covenant was the laws of Moses, right? Follow the rules. The new covenant is relationship with Christ. <laughs> in right his gift of righteousness and forgiveness purchased at the cross and, and your life in Christ and so very different things and the so in this in this uh, story after the flood uh, we're going to see Moses does something that that speaks of the two covenants it came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made and he sent out a raven which kept going to and fro until the waters had dried up from the earth and we're not after that one right now. But he also sent out from himself a dove. Oh, here's where it gets pretty interesting. What does a dove represent in the Bible? At least one, Holy Spirit, right? One of the things that when Jesus himself was baptized in the river, the beginning of his ministry, the Holy Spirit came upon him like a dove. And this is actually where that's foreshadowed at right here. And so this dove is going to represent the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and Noah sends out the dove to see if the waters had receded from the face of the ground. But the dove found no resting place. That's an important word. No resting place for the sole of her foot. She returned into the ark to him. For the waters were on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and drew her into the ark to himself. Holy Spirit sent out but came back. Symbolically. Go ahead. And he waited yet another seven days. And again he sent the dove out from the ark. And the dove came to him in the evening, and behold, a freshly plucked olive leaf was in her mouth, which kind of speaks of the reconciliation and peace with God through the cross. And Noah knew that the waters had receded from the earth. So he waited yet another seven days and sent out the dove, which did not return again to him anymore. This is, this is, this is interesting because it reveals Old Covenant, New Covenant. In the Old Covenant, God sent the, uh, the Holy Spirit into the world, right? Through the people under that covenant and the laws of Moses. But the Holy Spirit did not stay with them and stay upon them in the Old Covenant, right? And uh, specifically the, in the Old Covenant there, the, the Holy Spirit would come upon three kinds of people. The kings, the priests, and the prophets. And pretty much nobody else. Like kings, priests, and prophets would be anointed by the Holy Spirit, but it was always temporary as they're working, as, you know, uh, operating as king or while they're prophesying or while they're operating as priest, the Holy Spirit would temporarily come upon them. And even King Saul, who started off good and then turned out, you know, to have a heart of dishonor toward God, said the Holy Spirit just left him, right? <laughs> that doesn't happen in the New Covenant, by the way. It's good news. But the Holy Spirit, yeah, was... was the idea being that the Holy Spirit upon people was temporary in the Old Covenant. But when he sent out and the dove again, came back with the olive leaf, speaking of the reconciliation of Christ, and then he sent out the dove to, to find a rest, and the dove found a resting place, and the dove did not return. That resting place is, was first of all Jesus as a man, but then second of all, all of us. Redeemed people, born again people, right? The Holy Spirit comes now to live in us, be upon us, and he stays. And Jesus said that in John 14, I will send him to you and he will be with you always. Right? How cool is this, right? And then it's, it's, uh, you see the fulfillment of it in John uh, 1, 29 to 34. At the beginning of Jesus' ministry, John the Baptist is baptizing. And it said, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a, there it is, like a dove upon him. And he, what's the next word? <laughs> Remained upon him. There you go, there you go. Remained upon him. And I did not know him, John says, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, God said to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him. This is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. 
Ooh. And I've seen and testified that this is the Son of God. All right, if you jump back to 33 for a moment. This is so cool. So the dove comes back from heaven for the new covenant, right? It comes upon Jesus first and stays with Jesus, stays upon Jesus. But then it says that, that Jesus is now the one who baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. He's the one who sends the dove upon us also. And the dove, the Holy Spirit comes upon us in the new covenant and he stays. He stays. He finds a resting place. And it's you. And Jesus said he's going to be with you always. I know that's really good news, isn't it? I know it's so cool. And the, we're talking about the presence, though. That's, that's what this whole message is really about. I want to emphasize the idea of manifested presence. And when you're experiencing the presence of God in this world, do you know who specifically you're experiencing? The Holy Spirit. It is, because the Father God is actually seated in heaven, right, in the throne. Jesus is, is in a man's body, resurrected man's body, physically seated at the right hand of the Father. Right? It's the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity who comes into the earth now, who is with us and in us and upon us. It's him. He's a person. He's not a thing, right? When you talk about the Holy Spirit, please, please never, never say, I received it, I felt it. Please, please, please never do that. <laughs> Just, he's a him, right? Holy Spirit, is, he's God. He's a per person, third person of the Trinity. And we experience him, and we have a relationship with him. And he comes upon us to stay and be with us forever. <sighs> but what I'm really talking about today is the manifest presence. When you feel the manifest presence, the felt presence, the experienced presence, presence of God. It's the Holy Spirit. It is. It is. Oh, and it's a beautiful thing. Eh? Um, I mentioned, uh, and maybe it's been a couple of weeks ago, I talked about uh, the anointing and, the, and Jesus as the anointed one. Right? And so we call him, you know, in English, Jesus Christ. Christ is the Greek, from the Greek word. Uh, and in Hebrew, it's uh, Jesus Messiah. Yes, mes yeah, I can't pronounce it. It's okay. Messiah is where from the Hebrew word. And Messiah, the word Messiah means the anointed one. Literally means the anointed one. And so when Jesus began his ministry and the, the dove came upon him, the Holy Spirit came upon him, he became the anointed one. Right? Yeah. And the anointing, though, is just another word for the manifest presence. When you, feel, when you say, I felt the anointing, the anointing was there. The anointing was flowing. It's the manifest presence of the Holy Spirit, which is a beautiful thing because you, you feel his presence when we worship, right? Also, if sometimes you lay hands on somebody you, and you know, they get healed or they get delivered or whatever, right? God fills them, whatever happens. It's the anointing, right? But what that means is the manifest presence, because, yes, he's omnipresent. Yes, he's everywhere at once. But that doesn't mean everybody's experiencing him, does it? doesn't mean they're feeling him. The manifest presence. That's, ooh, we want that, don't we? Holy Spirit and his, and the anointing. And usually when we speak about the anointing, it's more specific. Like there's an anointing for healing ministry, or there's anointing to preach. There's an anointing for worship or for leading worship or, you know, whatever. Or just the anointing on your life to be a witness for Christ, to be an influencer for Christ. We all experience some measure of that anointing. Uh, what does is, what is God's presence feel like? This is interesting. This is fun. And people rarely talk about this. Uh, People experience the presence of God in different ways, but it's worth talking about for a moment um, because not everybody feels God the same, right? And, and, and again, I know that some people, some Christians that love Jesus really don't experience God that way, and you can, though. I absolutely believe you can. And, uh, and there's a couple of ways to experience his presence. One is that seeking thing again, right? Get alone with him and say, God, I want to know you. God, draw close to me. God, right? I'm hungry for you. Uh, another way of experience is his presence, though, is it turns out that the, that the presence is kind of transferable, which is why in the Bible you see people laying hands on somebody, right? Laying hands on somebody is a transference of presence. It's biblical. It's a beautiful thing, right? And you want that. I want that. I've had people that walk in more presence lay hands on me, right? And I'm happy to lay hands on anybody that wants more presence in their life, right? It's transferable. And, and the hungrier you are, the more it transfers, right? The humbler you are, humbler is that a word? The more humble you are and the more hungry, hungry you are, the more it transfers. It's a beautiful thing, right? So you can seek God privately and personally, which I highly recommend. You can also have people pray for you, which I also Highly recommend, right? 
So how do people experience the presence of God, though, often? Um, personally, what I feel when I feel the presence of God usually, or the anointing, is it feels like kind of a flow of light electricity. Almost like, like, you know, like a warm, subtle electricity flowing, right? How many feel that? You experience that? Okay, some of you, some of you, not everybody, though. Uh, other people feel God's presence manifested as kind of a heat or a warmth. It's, it's not just the room temperature. Like, there's a, there's a warmth. There's a heat that comes. Anybody feel God's presence that way sometimes? Okay? Okay, that's some of you. Uh, sometimes there's just a, a really profound sense of peace. And, like, you may not normally feel a lot of peace, you know, and suddenly there's a peace that's just like, <gasps> Peace, presence. How many have experienced God that way? Okay, that's a bunch of you. That's a bunch of you. And I hear that a lot. Uh, how about joy? When the presence of God really comes, like just joy just sort of bubbles up and you're like, oh, right? Exactly, right? And, that's, and, and there's other ways. My, my purpose is not to explore every way, but just to say people experience God in different ways. But that's the manifest presence. And it's good, right? We want that. We absolutely want that. Uh, and then how do people react? People talk about this even less. When the presence of God comes, right, in, in, in subtle ways normally, that's when we, we're really moved to worship. A lot of times, like, we're just, oh, man, I just want to lift my hands. I just want to worship. I just want to be in God's presence. Sing another song, you know. Uh, that's a common thing. But sometimes when the presence of, God, presence of God really hits hard, people respond in other ways, too. Um, shaking and trembling, right? Yeah, falling down. Yes. Uh, what else? Laughing. Sometimes the joy gets so intense that people start busting out laughing, right? And uh, it can be off-putting if you're not, you know, kind of used to what that's about. But, uh, but yeah, that supernatural laughter. And you can say, what are you laughing about? I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's, ah! <laughs> you know? <laughs> and uh, what else? There's, um, I don't know, there's, there's, other, there's other things. Sometimes just a suddenly intense desire to get down on your knees, Right, if you physically can, right? I just got to get down. I just got to kneel. I just got to bow before God. Like I got to get right face down or something. Sometimes that's a reaction to God's presence. I love strong reactions to God's presence. Right? I know that some some places like discourage that. That's weird. I encourage it, but don't never fake it. Never fake it. Never, never, never fake it to draw attention to yourself or whatever. However, if God's moving you and the the real thing, you know, His presence is there moving you. Yes. I, put, I, I value that highly, personally, because an encounter with God's presence like that is worth 10,000 sermons. In some ways, at least the effect it has upon you in sense of closeness to God and intimacy with God, right? It's, it's a powerful, powerful thing. And uh, yeah, so I put value on that. Um, let's, uh, let's go to John 4, starting verse 5. Uh, so there's a couple of symbols of the Holy Spirit that we also see uh, in the Bible, and I want to look at a couple of them here. Symbols of the Holy Spirit, because we already looked at the dove, right? So again, when you feel the manifested presence of God, generally speaking, it's the Holy Spirit, isn't it? It is, it is. And Jesus comes to you through the Holy Spirit, the Father comes to you through the Holy Spirit, but generally you're feeling the Holy Spirit. And, but today, again, what I want to focus on really is presence, Think in terms of the Holy Spirit as manifested presence. Yeah. And that gives you a, a another perspective, I think, that is really powerful. Uh, so here's a place where Jesus used a symbol of water uh, for the Holy Spirit. Jesus came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. And a woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And that was a compliment, by the way. And the woman of Samaria knew that, and she said, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? You're, you're talking to me, <laughs> right? You're acknowledging me? That's nice, because Jews normally would have no dealings with Samaritans. And so Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God... And who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. There you go. There's, there's our symbol, living water. Because by a well, there's water involved, but uh, Jesus turns it spiritual. And this is, this is pretty interesting, too, just how, how Jesus said to this woman, uh, you know, if, if you knew who I was, you'd ask me right now and I'd give you living water. 
right? Which is very, very cool because uh, also in the same conversation with this woman, uh, she said something about, well, we know the Messiah is coming soon, right? And Jesus said, yeah, it's me. Here I am. <laughs> Literally the only person Jesus said that to was this woman at the well in Samaria. Literally the only person. Even his own disciples, he's like, you got to figure it out. You got to, you know, listen to the Holy Spirit. Um, but, uh, you know, and other people approached Jesus it back in Jerusalem and said, oh, teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? You know, and Jesus said, you know the commandments, right? But he was still, he's still enforcing the old covenant law at that time. He was still teaching the old covenant law right up till the cross. And he said, well, you know the commandments, you know, and, and the implication was if you can keep all God's commandments perfectly, you're good. However, if you can't keep all God's commandments perfectly and you haven't, you might need a savior. Right? Here I am, right? So he had, Jesus had those conversations with people, but he mentioned the law. But with this woman, he does not say to her, well, you know, there's some commandments and you're breaking some of them. He didn't say that at all to her. And she was, in fact, right? <laughs> uh, he just says, yeah, if you knew who I was, you'd ask me and I'd give you living water. I am the Messiah. Nice to meet you. <laughs> it's a crazy encounter. It's just a cool thing. So the woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? She doesn't know what he's talking about yet. Are you greater than our father, Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Because their Samaritans are half Jewish, half Gentile, right? Go ahead. Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become... In him, a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. All right, there's the first symbol. Very, very cool. So Jesus uses the, the water as the symbol of the Holy Spirit, but we're talking about presence, right? Talking about presence. And so he says, if you, uh, if you just take one drink of my water, instantly that water will transfer and be located inside of you. Instantly inside of you, there will be a fountain and you could, you could say a drinking fountain. <laughs> you, you, you could, right? You legitimately say there's a drinking fountain that transfers inside of you, and it bubbles up, and you can drink from it anytime you want to. But it's the presence of God. It is the Holy Spirit, right? But he gives this, he gives this um, symbol of a fountain of water, drinking. And I want to uh, keep that symbol in mind. Because then uh, in John 7, Jesus does, does something else with this. So this is some time later in the same Gospel of John, and it says, On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Okay? And he who believes on me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Well, that's interesting. We're coming back. So this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those... Believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified, the cross and the resurrection, not yet. So back in 38, Jesus said this, if you, if you drink and if you believe in me, as the scripture has said, out of your heart will flow rivers of living water. And I noticed that the symbol changes and it increases because first he said, you get a drinking fountain inside of you, right? Which is kind of the little bubbling up thing you get to drink from it. And that's mostly for you the presence of God inside of you. But then he said, there's also another experience, which is rivers of living water flowing from you. That's not a little drinking fountain for you. That's, that's a flow of anointing and presence that comes from you to touch other people, to be a witness, an influence, a minister, an encouragement, whatever it is, a prayer warrior, whatever it is, that anointing that comes is also an increase for others, right? And so the, the contrast of this is very interesting, but isn't both times he's talking about water? Same symbol, right? He's talking about the Holy Spirit. There's only one Holy Spirit, right? Not two different spirits, one Holy Spirit. He says, first, he comes to you with his drinking fountain, presence for you, in you. Second, if you want, he comes to you as a river flowing from you, presence flowing towards others, right? Same symbol, water, but more. Which is where basically what I'm focusing on today. The idea was just presence and then more presence. Right? More presence. Right? So you, you could technically call this the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and, and it is. And I, and I have taught that, and I do teach that. However, you know, you can, you can divide it up theologically here into the first 
part is born again, the drinking fountain. The second part is baptism in the Holy Spirit, the river. Technically true. However, today, what I just want to focus on is presence. Presence. Manifested presence. Right? You think of that. And that's highly desirable, right? Just like Moses said, come on, God, I want to know you more. I want more. Show me your glory. Come on, right? And then, now, there's another symbol that Jesus uses here also in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, 1 through 8, which is the, the wind, symbol of the Holy Spirit, symbol of the presence. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher. Come from God. For no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. Which was a big admission here because he's part of the Pharisees and they already don't like Jesus. But this guy is more intellectually honest and, he's, and he comes secretly, but he says, tell me, right? <laughs> Come on, who are you? What's going on here? All right. And Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. All right, so now we're going to talk about being born again. But this, I think it's funny. It's, it said that Jesus answered him. That doesn't sound like the answer to the question at all to me, right? It sounds like Jesus changing this, this, the topic to what he wants. Let's talk about being born again. Okay, <laughs> right, sure, right? And Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? He's talking about can you enter in and come back out? This is weird. I don't know what you're talking about, right? He doesn't get it. Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Okay? So what's born of water? My understanding is that when a woman's pregnant, the baby's carried in water. When the water breaks, the baby's coming, right? And I know you could say, well, water means something else, but uh, Jesus confirms it in the next verse, actually. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Being born of the water is being born of flesh. It's your first birth. Then, being born of the Spirit is your second birth, born again, and that's when you become a child of God. Okay? And Jesus said, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Now here, I read this because Jesus used the symbol of the wind here in association with being born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Oh, well, that's interesting, isn't it? If you're born again, you're born of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit's with you, he's leading you and guiding you, but nobody can see him, and nobody knows how you're being led, how you're being influenced and guided that they can't see, right? But like the wind, you can hear the sound, you can hear wind blowing, can't you? But you can't see the wind. You can see leaves on a tree shaking, but you can't see the wind, right? And Jesus said, it's just like that with the Holy Spirit. You can see the effect he has on people. You can see how he leads and guides people, but you don't see him, right? Ooh. So it's a mystery to somebody who doesn't know him. And so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Interesting, huh? Yeah, of course, when the, Holy, when the wind blows strong, the leaves on the tree start to shake too. <laughs> it gets fun that way. Anyway, go ahead. Uh, in John uh, 20, jumping up here, uh, one of my most common verses here, but let's look at it from this perspective. On the day of the resurrection, the same day at evening being the first day of the week, the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, peace to you. That's the olive branch or the olive leaf, by the way, that, that the dove back, back, brought back to Noah. Peace to you, right? Peace with the Father. Reconciliation. And as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he, there it is. He breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. So resurrection day, right? Jesus breathes on them, which is, he's also showing that he's God, right? Yeah, that he's God manifest as a human in a human body now, resurrected body. But he's showing that him he's God. He doesn't say, oh, God in heaven, would you pour out some, you know. He's, he says, it's me. <laughs> and breathes on them. And they, he said, receive the Holy Spirit. And they did. And so this, but, they, but literally there was wind, wasn't there? I mean, soft breath. <laughs> right? Literally wind, which ties back to John 3. Being born of the Spirit is like the wind, right? And here he said, here's the wind, <laughs> right? Here's the breath. Here he is, okay? 
And, and this is the new birth, receive the Holy Spirit. But then you go up to um, the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost, 50 days later. Acts 2, 1 through 4. The day of Pentecost had fully come, and the disciples were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a, what do we got now? <laughs> Rushing mighty wind. Ooh. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them also divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them. Would you go back to two for a second? This is interesting. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven, a rushing mighty wind. So apparently Jesus is breathing on them again. Right? Only this time it's not a soft breath. This time it's... <laughs> right? But just like the symbol of the water, first he said, drinking fountain in you, presence. Then he said, river flowing through you, presence. Right? And now he says, there's a wind, there's a breath, presence. And there's a rushing mighty wind, presence. <sighs> same spirit, same Holy Spirit, but more. Right? And for an expanded purpose also. Whew. All I want to focus on today is the idea of presence, though. Just presence. Manifested presence. So good, right? Oh, so good. It's just like being married to somebody, right? Would you, like, would you be good with being married to somebody, but they live in a different state? You never see them or really interact with them, but the marriage license is on the wall. Would that be okay with anybody, right? Or would you ra rather, right, live together and experience and this is all I'm saying. The manifested presence of God with you makes this like this real relationship as opposed to a theological relationship, right? That someday I'll go see God in heaven. Now, this is real right now. Manifested presence and more presence and more presence and more presence, right? Don't even be satisfied with a little presence. Be like hungry, super hungry. If I can, if I can put anything in you right now, it'd be super hungry, super hunger for more presence, more presence, right? Which would drive you to get alone with God and say, God, I want to know you more. And it would also drive you to have, say, I want people to pray for me and lay hands on me because it's transferable, right? So they filled the whole house where they were sitting. Go ahead. There appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. One sat upon each of them. There's fire also, but I'm not going to talk about that now. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And I believe that both of these, uh, the, these gifts are for today uh, because I experienced this Holy Spirit baptism 43 years ago, started speaking in tongues shortly after that, and, I've, and I've, I speak in tongues or pray in tongues every day of my life for 43 years, including today, tomorrow, and the next day. I just, that's part of my life. Uh, however... Today, let's just look at the idea of they were all what? Filled. If the, really the, I, I know in sometimes charismatic or Pentecostal circles, right, there's kind of the sense sometimes of like speaking in tongues, like you check the box. You know, like, okay, check the box, cross the line. And that's, that's probably not a great way of thinking. I mean, I value tongues a lot. I, I do. And it's a, it's, it's a very powerful gift and it's a valuable gift and it has a real purpose. I value it a lot. But it's not a box to check. Right? And the, the thing starts off with, they were all what? Filled with Holy Spirit. Filled with presence. It's not just, okay, cross the line, speak in tongues, right? It's get filled with presence. And get more filled with presence. And more filled with presence. And tongues does come. It does. Right? It comes with the filling of presence. It does. However, presence is... Right? Be filled with presence. Ooh. So valuable. What if we think more in terms of the person in his presence rather than one of the gifts he brings? I'm just, I'm just bringing right, the perspective there because I value the gift of tongues too. I do. Uh, but the presence, oh my goodness, the presence. Um, Acts 8. I just want to read one more thing in Acts 8. And I want to say, too, um, I meant to say this first service and I forgot, but the presence of God, manifested presence of God, is not like a reward for doing everything right and being perfect. It's not. The presence of God is not a confirmation that you're doing everything right and that everything you do is perfect. It's not that either. The presence of God is a gift to you, no matter how broken you are, so that you can grow in Christ and become that person that God wants you to be. God's presence is your equipping. God's presence is a gift, not a reward, not a confirmation. 
whew, it's a gift. And the more broken you are, the more you want that gift like right now, right? Now. Now I want more of God's presence now. Yeah. It's not just for the special people that do everything right. right. So in, in Acts chapter 8, uh, I want to talk about just briefly about how the presence of God also is transferable in a, in a sense. And it's, it's a beautiful thing. So there was a persecution that happened in uh, Jerusalem area. And those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. People fled the persecution, but they were preaching. And Philip, a guy named Philip, went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed. And many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Well, yeah, because the, that's the anointing. Remember, the anointing is also another word for the manifest presence of God, right? And the anointing can be felt. The anointing can cause a lot of things to happen. It can cause healing and miracles. The anointing can uh, just fill you with joy. The anointing can bring prophetic revelation to you, and you prophesy and say things that God is telling you to say. The anointing has all kinds of manifestations, right? Some with power or effect, some with just feeling. It's all good. That's the, the manifest presence. So there's great joy, there's miracles, people healed, delivered. And when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized, meaning in water. They're now baptized as believers, right? And uh, they're born again, Holy Spirit's in them, true? They got the drinking fountain inside of them, right? They got the, you know, the breath, the born again breath of God inside. They have the presence of God in them. They have the Holy Spirit at this point, and they're water baptized. But then what happens? In verse 14, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Oh, that's interesting, right? Isn't that awesome? What does that mean? They're already born again, aren't they? They already got that, that breath of the Holy Spirit, that presence inside of them already. They already got the drinking fountain, this manifested presence of God. And yet the, the apostles say, yeah, they need more. There's more. We're going to go pray for them. And they're going to get more. Right? Because this is the apostle's heart. Like, this is important. They need more. I want them to have more. The more. I want them to have the river of living water. I want them to have the rushing mighty wind. Same Holy Spirit, but more presence. That's my whole point. More presence. Whew. Wow. And so notice also it says that they're going to come and pray for them. They're not going to go say, oh, they're not going to ask God to give them the Holy Spirit. They're not going to beg, oh, God, would you give them the Holy Spirit? Because that's, that's done. God already gave the Holy Spirit. That was done on the day of Pentecost. What they're going to pray for is that they will receive the Holy Spirit that's been given. With more presence. I have a high value for more presence. Right? Okay. And so, for as yet, he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And that's lots of Christians. Baptized, saved, born again. But the apostle, the early apostles said, there's more. There's more presence. There's more presence. There's more manifested presence. Oh, rivers of living water. Rushing mighty wind. Go ahead. And so, verse 17, then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Or, as we're emphasizing today, they received the greater presence, the increased measure of presence. So, notice it wasn't just about get them to speak in tongues, check a box, right? It was about more presence, more of the presence of this person called the Holy Spirit. <sighs> right? And, oh... I can tell you there's always more. <laughs> there's always more. If you value God's presence and you go after it, I don't care what you do in life. You don't have to be a minister, right? You don't have to be a preacher. I don't care what you do in life. If you value God's presence and you ask him for more, you will walk in more presence. You will, you will, you will, you will, you will. You will, right? And it will set you apart. People will feel it, know it, see it, right? There will be presence. It's a powerful, powerful thing. God wants that for you, and he wants to do that with you. So my whole point there, again, though, is how did they get them to be an increased presence? They laid hands on them. It's transferable. Spiritual gifts are often transferable. 
presence of the Holy Spirit is transferable. And the hungrier you are, the more it transfers to you, right? And the more you want this, the more it transfers to you. That's true also. But we're not transferring a thing. You're transferring the presence of a person called the Holy Spirit. Increased presence. So with that, you know what I want to do right now? I want to pray. <laughs> and Todd's going to give me a, he's going to give us some chords on the piano, yeah? And just take a few minutes. And I want to do, I want to do two things. One is... Uh, just We can just ask God to increase presence in us, right? Absolutely. Holy Spirit, come and increase your presence with us. But also, we're going to just walk around the room and sort of pray for people, you know, lightly. We're not going to take a long, long time. We're not. But we're going to walk around the room. I think I'm going to get, is Chris available still? Is Todd, or uh, Tom available? Sorry. Yeah. And uh, we'll just have, we'll walk around. I will too. We'll just walk around the room and pray with people briefly. And just, we're just going to invite the Holy Spirit to bring more presence. Is that good? It's good, yeah. So if you're comfortable standing up, would you please? Uh, I'd rather stand for this. If you're, if you're not physically comfortable standing, that's fine. That's fine. But otherwise, let's stand if you would. And <clears throat> Hallelujah. And just begin to... Uh... Yeah. Tom went to, yeah, went to Brazil with me twice here. We're going to send him around. And Chris, and they'll just come around and start to pray over you. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead you in prayer also. And I, I just want you to be, please be proactive on this. Don't be passive and just like stand there. The pastor's going to pray. What I want you to do is, even if it's a whisper, great. Whisper to God. God, I want you. God, I want more presence. God, I want you to fill me. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. More presence. Oh. More presence. Hallelujah. The river, the river, the rushing mighty wind the dove from heaven, more presence. Come, Holy Spirit, touch us, fill us. You may want to lift your hands. You want to may, may lift your face. Just be whispering that prayer. Fill me, God, fill me. Oh, more presence, God. More of your anointing manifested presence. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Presence. Presence. Hmm. Hallelujah. Presence. Come, Holy Spirit, more. Presence. Presence. More, stronger presence. We want to walk in your presence. We want to walk in your glory. Presence. Shaza, presence. Shazuaba, presence. Holy Spirit, more. Fill, fill us. Presence. Rivers of living water. Rushing mighty wind. Presence. Increase, increase, increase. Hallelujah. Presence, presence, presence. More, more. Shali Salama Saba. Presence, presence. Oh God, your precious presence. Your beautiful, holy presence. Your strong presence. Increase, more, more. Hallelujah. More presence. 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 Shaza. More. 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 Presence. 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 She's the, she's the presence. Come, Holy Spirit. Presence. Beautiful presence. 
beautiful presence. Stronger. Shh. Filling, filling, filling. Presence. Shazika lamana shaya soko. Presence, presence, presence. Presence. There's a chair there. Presence, presence. See, Koshiza. Increase, increase, increase. Hallelujah. Presence, presence. Presence. More, God. Everybody just, yeah, just uh, continue to seek God personally for this time. We're just going to take a couple more minutes. But just be proactive, please. Ask Him more, God. Fill me more. Presence. That's all we're fo focusing on right now. Presence. Thank you, God. More presence. Presence. Holy Spirit. Presence. 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 Increase. 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 Presence. Increase. Come upon us, God, with presence. 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 Shh. Anointing. Manifest presence. Manifest presence. Shino Sayaka. Presence, God. Manifest presence. More. Presence. Come come upon us, God. Increase, God. Presence. Fill us. Holy Spirit, fill. Fill him. Presence. 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 More, God. More. Shazza. Presence. Excuse me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. More. Shane. Presence. Presence, God. We're hungry. Holy Spirit, move in us more. Fill us more. Fill us to overflowing. Presence. Presence. Presence, God. Can I pray for you? Presence, Lord. Holy Spirit. Presence. Presence. Holy Spirit, fill, fill, fill them, fill them. Fill them, God. Fill them. Presence. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh God, presence. Holy presence. Holy presence. She's Alikiaba. Presence, God, presence.
That's good. That's good. I trust God is touching you, increasing his presence in you, upon you. That's good. That's good. I encourage you still after this. Seek God. Seek God in private. More, God. More of your presence. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to close officially. God bless you guys.